14-year-old Nicole Smith lived in Atlanta, Georgia in 1995. On June 7th, she and her sister were walking to Ralph Bunch Middle School. On the way, Nicole realized she forgot something at home. She then headed back alone and cut through the woods. Sadly, Nicole would never make it back home. In the woods, she came across a man who indecently assaulted her and then shot her in the face two times. Investigators collected male DNA from her body and stored it for later use. Despite investigators' efforts, they didn't find any useful leads and the case went cold. In 2002, Detective Vincent Velasquez reopened the case. For two years, he was unsuccessful in his quest, but then a small breakthrough was made. In 2004, 13-year-old Betty Brown of East Point, Georgia was indecently assaulted by a man. Fortunately, she survived the attack. It happened just miles away from where Nicole's life was taken. Investigators found the DNA from both attacks is the same. This meant the attacker most likely lived in the area. Betty was able to describe the suspect as an African-American man, possibly in his 30s. A sketch was made and shared around, but didn't lead to anything. Detective Velasquez worked the case tirelessly, being in constant contact with Smith's family, conducting hundreds of interviews and over 50 blood samples before he retired in 2017. Detective Scott DeMeester then took over the case. Using genealogy and ancestry databases, it took investigators three years to find the person of interest. DeMeester got word that the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Lab was able to match the DNA profile in the assault of Betty Brown. A few days later in 2022, Nicole's case could also be closed as it was confirmed that it was the same man responsible. The Atlanta Police Department then held a press conference to announce it to the public. Police did not state the suspect's name during the press conference. They said investigators wanted the moment to be about the victims, their families, and detectives who dedicated their hard work and time to solve the case. They only said the attacker passed away on August 29, 2021, while in hospice care for liver and kidney failure. Nicole's mother said she had been living without closure in the horrific incident for nearly three decades. She called the moment bittersweet and said she's fighting to take one day at a time. Today for me is a bittersweet moment. I never imagined this person to be deceased. So many unanswered questions that I had for him that I can never ask or get answers. I would never say it was closure for me because I'll live with this pain for the rest of my life. Her mother said as tears ran down her cheeks. Betty Brown, who is now all grown up with children of her own, said that she has hidden that part of her life for years. Betty also said she never thought she would see the day where she would be talking about what happened to her. I'm so conflicted because, on one hand, I want to rise above and not let this control me. But on the other hand, I want his family to suffer because he's not here to suffer. I want him to feel the pain that my family has felt for years. Furthermore, Betty stated that Nicole's mother and Detective Velasquez have both been in contact with her over the decades and that their care had been invaluable. All of these years and checking on me to make sure that I'm okay, I appreciate you because I needed that. After the press conference was done, it was revealed that the attacker was 49-year-old Kelvin Arnold. We don't know much about this worthless individual other than the fact that he's not alive anymore and that he lived close to both of the victims. Four-year-old Jessica Gutierrez, or Jessie as she was known, lived in Red Bank, South Carolina in 1986. On June 6th, Jessica's mother Deborah woke up and went to Jessica's room. Deborah found a window open and no sign of Jessica. Jessica's six-year-old sister, who was in the room, said that a man with a magic hat and a beard took Jessica. Deborah called the police to report what had happened, and the search started. Investigators were not able to find Jessica, but they interviewed more than 125 people and reviewed more than 3,500 pages of documents with the help of the FBI personnel from 10 field offices. The search for Jessica and the person who took her went on for years. That was until 2022. On January 6, 2022, investigators from the Lexington County Sheriff's Department announced that a 61-year-old man from North Carolina had been arrested in connection to the case. The man is Thomas Eric McDowell. He was arrested by Wake Forest Police Department in Raleigh, North Carolina. According to investigators, Thomas's fingerprints matched the fingerprint found in Jessica's room. He had apparently also confessed to people that he took Jessica and ended her life. At the time of the crime, Thomas also lived in the area. He wore large cowboy hats, which might have been the magic hat that Jessica's sister was referring to. 
With the arrest now made, it is hoped that Thomas will reveal where Jessica's body is, assuming she's not alive anymore. In case she is alive, here's an image of what she might look like today. Thomas will now be prosecuted by the South Carolina Attorney General's Office. He is currently being held at the Wake County Detention Center. On October 24th, 1994, partially buried remains were found in the area of Date Palm Drive and Ramon Road in Riverside County, California. The remains belonged to a woman. Investigators were able to determine that her life was taken by someone. There were no clues about her identity. A sketch was made of her face, but no one came forward that recognized her, and the case went cold. Recently, a private lab in Woodlands, Texas called Othram Inc. made use of genetic genealogy using DNA from the victim. They found a man who they believed is the son of the woman. He gave them his DNA sample. After some more testing, they confirmed that he was indeed her son, and now they had her identity. She is 57-year-old Patricia Cavallaro, who lived in Bellflower, California. Her husband reported her missing in 2001, saying only that she had vanished after leaving home. He passed away in 2017. Ancestry records show Cavallaro was born in 1937 in Oneida, New York, but moved to California when she married in 1956. She had two children and settled in Bellflower. It is a bit strange that her body was found in 1994 and her husband only reported her missing in 2001, but I'll let the investigators look into that. If you have any information about who might have taken her life, you can contact investigators at this number. Here's a picture of Patricia next to the sketch of her, because I know you guys like to see how accurate the sketch was. 48-year-old Susan Winters lived in Henderson, Nevada in 2015 with her husband Gregory Brent Dennis and two teenage daughters. Susan was a judge and Gregory was a doctor. On January 3, 2015, Gregory called 911 to report Susan was unresponsive and needed an ambulance. She was taken to the hospital, but did not make it. A mixture of antifreeze was found in her system. At first, it was believed that she might have taken her own life by ingesting the antifreeze. Investigators then found Gregory had an expensive drug habit. He also stood to inherit $2 million in the event of his wife's demise. According to friends, Gregory and Susan was on the verge of separation when her life ended. Investigators also found that Gregory only called emergency responders after she stopped breathing. Inexplicably, Gregory also signed a do not resuscitate order when she arrived at the hospital. Days after Susan's passing, Gregory deposited a $180,000 check from her bank account into his own bank account. The check had been issued the night before Susan lost her life. According to a friend of Gregory, he wanted the money because he knew Susan's parents would freeze the account. This meant that Gregory knew Susan would not be alive anymore before it happened. The final piece of evidence came when investigators took a look at Gregory's computer. He searched for information on the internet on how long after poisoning someone using antifreeze it would take the victim to pass away. In 2017, he was finally arrested in connection to the case. Shortly after being arrested, he posted a $250,000 bail and was released. In 2022, Gregory and his legal team pleaded guilty and agreed to a sentence of 3 to 10 years behind bars. He is scheduled to be sentenced on May 10th in the Clark County District Court. On November 17, 1978, a person cutting firewood in Klamath County, Oregon came across two bodies, a young man and woman. Both of them had been fatally shot. Carl Burkhart, who was then a detective for the Klamath County Sheriff's Office, arrived at the scene soon after. Investigators quickly identified the first body as 19-year-old Kirk Leonard Wiseman. The second was identified as 17-year-old Cynthia Lynn Freyer. In the autopsy, it was discovered that Cynthia had been indecently assaulted. Neither of the two victims had a connection to the Klamath County area. Then, Chief of Police Dan Toma was quoted as saying that day, you could tell whoever did it didn't have much respect for human life, the way the bodies were disposed. Deputies determined that Kirk and Cynthia had been hitchhiking through the area. One of the few items recovered from the scene was a sign that read, K Falls. Police also determined that the two had stayed a night at the motel in Rosenberg, Oregon, and was then picked up by a person who claimed to have dropped them off at the Grants Pass restaurant. They also found a letter written by Cynthia, addressed to her mother, which mentioned that she and Kirk had lots of fun in Washington State. That was all the investigators had. They knew who the victims were, but not who had taken their lives. The original evidence bags from 1978 remained locked away in storage throughout the years. 
By 2011, Detective Nick Kennedy took over the case. He looked through the pieces of evidence for anything that could potentially be analyzed for DNA. DNA was a tool that didn't exist for law enforcement back in 1978, but the technology was becoming better every decade. Later, Detective Geneva Lewis took over for Nick Kennedy. She sent a few items of Cynthia's clothing to the Oregon State Police Crime Lab. From 2011 to 2018, little DNA was found on the items, because by then, they were already more than 30 years old. It was only in 2019 when Detective Dan Towery took over the case that a breakthrough would come. He received a call from Devin Mast who worked for the crime lab. Devin Mast told him that they finally found DNA belonging to an unknown man that they could use. Devin sent the samples to another lab in Portland, Oregon. They confirmed the presence of a DNA from an unknown male. It wasn't much of a breakthrough, but it was the first one police had in decades. The DNA sample was then entered into the Combined DNA Index System, a nationwide database of DNA samples. Unfortunately, there were no hits. Detective Dan Towery then decided to contact Parabon Nanolabs. Parabon had been vital in solving many cold cases over the last few years. For Parabon to test the DNA sample and help identify the person that took Kirk and Cynthia's life would cost $8,000. Investigators decided it was well worth it if it could bring peace to the families of the victims. Parabon then used genetic genealogy to predict the suspect's ancestry. They used that to produce what they call a snapshot image to show what the man looked like. Parabon also used the DNA to find relatives of the suspect. In 2021, they told investigators that they had a viable suspect, Ray Whitson Jr. Parabon also said that his DNA was found on Cynthia's clothing, indicating that he was definitely involved. Investigators then tried to locate Whitson. They soon learned that he passed away in Texas in 1996. He had no criminal history. At the time of the crime, he lived in Klamath County area, where he worked at a lumber mill. Investigators collected DNA samples from two of Whitson's living children. This confirmed that it was his DNA found on Cynthia's body and other pieces of evidence. Whitson's children also confirmed that he owned the same type of weapon that was used at the crime. The area where Cynthia and Kirk was found was also known to be frequented by Whitson. When investigators were confident with their findings, a report was submitted to the Klamath County District Attorney, Eve Costello, for review. Costello said she determined that the evidence would be strong enough to prosecute Whitson if he was alive today. If we had just been 10 or 15 years earlier, we would have been able to hold the individual accountable in a way that we now cannot do, said Costello, tears welling in her eyes. What we have been able to do is bring closure for a family, because when somebody's life is taken and you don't know really what happened, you just know they left the universe in a really awful way. It leaves you with a really huge, hollow feeling. This work has allowed that family to have some degree of peace. The letter that Cynthia wrote to her mother could now finally be given to her as it was a piece of evidence for all these years. In July of 2009, an unknown man broke into an apartment of a woman in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He restrained her, then indecently assaulted her before running away. The woman called 911. DNA from the unknown man was then collected. In 2021, investigators used advances in DNA to finally identify the man. In 2022, 39-year-old Philip Alford was arrested in connection with the case. His DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene. Scott Johnson was born in 1961 in the United States. In 1983, Scott moved to England so that he could study mathematics at the University of Cambridge. There, he met Michael Noon. Michael was a musicologist from Australia. The pair fell in love. Then, in 1986, Scott moved to Canberra, Australia on a student visa to complete his PhD at the Australian National University. That way, he could be with Michael. On December 10, 1988, a man's body was found on rocks at the foot of cliffs at Bluefish Point in Northhead near Manly, Sydney. The man was quickly identified as 27-year-old Scott Johnson. The police initially believed that he took his own life and jumped down the cliff. His family disputed this. They brought up the fact that his clothes were neatly folded on top of the cliff and that his wallet was stolen. One of Scott's professors also said that he had just put the final touches on his PhD. He was hopeful for the future and could have a job at any of the great universities around the world. Something else that pointed to the possibility that Scott was pushed and did not jump was that there were gangs of men who roamed various Sydney locations in search of gay men to hurt. It was only in 2017 that investigators believed that Scott did not take his own life. 
a renewed police investigation was then launched. In 2018, a $1 million reward for information which could help solve the crime was announced. Scott's brother Steve Johnson, who is a tech entrepreneur, then gave a million dollars of his own money to make the reward two million. The reward proved to be key to finally solving this cold case. In May of 2020, investigators arrested Scott White in connection to the case. It was announced that someone came forward and told investigators that White was the one that pushed Scott off the cliff. Then, on January 10th, 2022, White confessed in court. He took responsibility for taking Scott's life. White is now convicted of the crime and will soon be sentenced. Steve had this to say following the arrest. Suddenly, it was over. This man finally found the soul to confess and put an end to this. My family are all in tears. Investigators are now looking into similar crimes that took place in the 70s and 80s. On October 29, 2007, a man's body was found in a desert area of Stanfield, Arizona, by hunters. He was identified as 37-year-old Arturo Martinez Altamarino. Thanks to witnesses, investigators quickly identified Oscar Tejeda Mejia as the man responsible for taking the life of Arturo. The only problem was that he was nowhere to be found. For years, the case went cold as they couldn't find him. Then, in 2017, investigators learned that Oscar was living in Mexico. In 2018, a DNA sample was acquired with the help of a person close to Oscar. It was confirmed that he is responsible for what happened to Arturo. It took a few more years for investigators to get Oscar back to the United States. Finally, on January 12, 2022, 59-year-old Oscar was extradited to Arizona and booked into jail. Sheriff Mark Lamb said, I am impressed by my detectives and their commitment to bring this suspect to justice. When political boundaries threatened to derail their progress, our guys and gals got creative. It is not known yet why Oscar took the life of Arturo. In August of 2003, skeletal remains were found in the area of Highway 5 and County Road in Bradford Township, Minnesota. The remains were found during an excavation project by a landowner. It was believed that the body belonged to a white male. He was roughly 20 to 28 years old and had been buried there for many years, most likely decades. The Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension created a DNA profile for the victim. The DNA profile and dental records were entered into missing persons databases, but no matches were found. A facial reconstruction was made to try and generate clues to the unidentified person's identity. Unfortunately, no one came forward with useful information. Investigators named the man Asante County John Doe, as they were unable to identify him. Over several years, investigators submitted DNA samples of people who believed that he was a possible relative of theirs, but no relatives could be confirmed. In 2019, Chief Deputy Lisa Lovering started the process of using advanced DNA technology to try and identify the remains. It was submitted to labs in 2019 and 2020, but the DNA sample was not suitable to be analyzed further. Then, in 2021, Lisa learned of Texas-based forensic laboratory, Othram Inc., which uses a newer technology called forensic-grade genome sequencing to build DNA profiles from skeletal remains. Othram was then able to develop a new viable DNA extract. They then built a comprehensive DNA profile. The DNA profile was sent to investigative genetic genealogy consultant Barbara Ray Venter and Chief Deputy Lovering. Within just 24 hours, Barbara Ray had a match of a distant relative for the remains. Based on the family tree, she was able to locate two siblings of the victim and a phone number. All of this information was passed to the investigators who worked on the case. They called the siblings. A family member returned the call and confirmed that their brother, Donald Rindall of Ramsey County, Minnesota, had been missing since 1970. They were told that the FBI had been looking for him prior to his disappearance due to involvement he had with drugs. Chief Deputy Lovering then met with the family and obtained DNA samples from the siblings. These samples were submitted to the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. In the start of 2022, it was announced that investigators were able to confirm that the Asante County John Doe is indeed Donald Rindall. Based on the information from the family, as well as from the scene in 2003, it is believed that someone took Donald's life. It is believed that Donald was buried in Asante County in late 1970 to early 1971 at the age of 22. It is further believed that there still may be people alive today who know what happened to Donald in 1970. Investigators are asking anyone with any information to contact the Asante County Sheriff's Office at this number or Crime Stoppers of Minnesota. There was disbelief 
Lovering shared, describing her phone call with Rindall survivors. It was a random phone call, someone calling about their brother they hadn't seen in 51 years. There was a lot of shock and disbelief at first, and I think once I got the DNA match, it set in a little more, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions for them. We don't know who was involved, and we don't know what happened. Oftentimes, law enforcement is the voice for the vulnerable or the victims that cannot speak. That is very true in this case. We were able to return a loved one home to a family who did not know his whereabouts for 51 years. 51-year-old Janet Yeary lived in Kokomo, Indiana. On Thanksgiving Day in 2004, she was preparing food for her family. Later in the day, her family called her many times, but she did not answer. The next morning, on November 26, Janet's daughter Carly Martin went to her house to see why Janet was not responding. She saw that the garage door was open. Then she went inside. She found Janet's body. She had been beaten. Investigators arrived at the scene and was able to find blood belonging to the suspect. It was collected so they could use it later. Detectives from Kokomo Police Department walked door to door in the neighborhood to ask if anyone saw anything suspicious. This led police to a man from Peru named Danny Case. Case had reportedly been dropped off in Janet's neighborhood the night before Thanksgiving. He had no way to get home, so he started knocking on doors in an attempt to get a ride from someone. Investigators found that Case had been wanted in Miami County on a charge of attempting to take someone's life. On January 25, 2005, Case was arrested at Indianapolis International Airport. Frustratingly, before Kokomo detectives had a chance to speak to him, he hanged himself in his holding cell at the airport. Despite Kokomo police believing all signs pointed to Case, detectives were never able to gather enough evidence against him. The blood found at the crime scene was not enough to be used for DNA testing. For 17 years, the case went cold, and some speculated that there will never be closure for the family. Then recently, in 2021, an acquaintance of Case came forward and told investigators that Case once confessed to him that he took Janet's life. Case said that he knocked on the woman's door and asked about using her phone to call for a ride. It's not known why he then decided that it's necessary to end her life. In 2022, investigators met with the relatives of Janet. After a lengthy discussion, the family agreed the case should be closed due to the fact that Case is not alive anymore. On January 14, 2022, it was announced to the public. Kokomo police had this to say in a statement. We understand this is a difficult time for the family as these conversations open the wounds that this senseless tragedy left with her family. Our condolences remain with Janet Yeary and her amazing family. We pray for peace for all of you. Twenty-three-year-old Jonathan David Rogers lived in Austin, Texas. On August 24, 2018, Jonathan was fatally shot in the chest by an unknown man near Cook Elementary School in North Austin. He was taken to a nearby hospital but there was unfortunately nothing they could do for him. He was gone. Over the next few years, witnesses came forward and investigators conducted a lot of interviews. They finally concluded that 25-year-old DeAndre Eric Connor was responsible for what happened to Jonathan. A U.S. Marshals-led task force then arrested Connor on January 6, 2022. He was found less than a mile away from the crime scene. Connor was taken to the Travis County Jail, where he is awaiting judicial proceedings. He is held on a $500,000 bond. Typical kid. He enjoyed fishing. Uh, he enjoyed hanging out with his friends. He was all about family. And um, kid had a big heart. I remember pulling up to my mother's house and seeing all the lights. Uh, and I remember the, the doctor coming out and telling my wife, your son didn't make it. We've been living, you know, in this bubble where we're trying to figure out who did this, if it's, if somebody was gonna ever be caught. You know, we've, we've gone through four detectives, cold case detectives in four years or in three and a half years. There's no relief in this. Um, it just rekindles bad memories, bad visions. <laughs> I miss my son every day. And that's hard. Because <laughs> somebody took something from me. 
and I can't get it back. You mentioned in 2018 that you would forgive whoever did this. What's your message to them? Yeah, you stole from me. You stole my life. At that time, when we did the first interview, it was, um, I thought it was the right thing to say. This hurt a lot of people. And uh, my son was, it was my son. And somebody stole his life. Twenty-nine-year-old Sonia Mejia lived in Taylorsville, Utah in 2006. She was six months pregnant. On February 9, 2006, her husband found her body in the bedroom of their apartment. She was strangled. Three pieces of jewelry were stolen from Sonia. A heart-shaped ruby ring, a diamond ring, and a medallion of Our Lady Guadalupe fastened to a gold chain. On the same day, two years later in 2008, 57-year-old Damiana Castillo was also strangled by an unknown culprit. Her son found her when she did not show up for church. At Damiana's house, the contents of her purse, including her wallet, had been dumped out onto the couch, and her jewelry boxes were disturbed. Damiana and Sonia lived just one mile from each other. Because of these similarities between the two crimes, investigators believe that one person was responsible. Police found fingerprints at both crime scenes, on a Cheetos bag and a Coke bottle in Sonia's apartment and Damiana's wallet. DNA was also found on the Coke bottle, as well as on the items apparently used to strangle the women. In 2009, investigators determined, using the DNA evidence, that, that it was in fact one man responsible for taking both Sonia and Damiana's lives. The DNA collected from the crime scene did not match any DNA samples in law enforcement databases, however. In 2016, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System reported a match of the fingerprints found at the crime scenes with Juan Antonio Ariola Murillo. Ariola Murillo had been deported to Mexico in 2008, and documents stated that there is no record of him returning to the U.S. since then. In 2018, investigators announced that DNA also linked Ariola Murillo to the crime. Finally, in 2022, 41-year-old Juan Antonio Ariola Murillo was extracted from Mexico and finds himself in jail. He faces life in prison if convicted. 63-year-old Helen Margaret Brooks lived in Apple Valley, California in 1985. She was a well-liked woman who modeled for Lolo's Fashion Boutique at the Apple Valley Inn. On July 5, 1985, Helen's friends and co-workers became alarmed after not hearing from her in a few days. They then went to her home in Apple Valley Gardens Apartments. Inside of her apartment, they found Helen's body. She had been strangled. Investigators collected DNA evidence from the scene, but were limited to the DNA technology of the time. Investigators learned that 37-year-old Robert Eugene Wartman met Helen in the days prior to her life being taken, and was in her apartment between July 3rd and July 5th. Wartman was interviewed by investigators. He said that he had no knowledge of what happened to Helen and denied he went into her apartment. Investigators could not prove that he was responsible in any way, so the case went cold for many years. Over the years, several interviews and polygraph tests were conducted, but it did not bring investigators any closer to solving the case. In 2009, cold case detectives re-examined the case and submitted items for DNA testing. A DNA profile for the suspect was developed, but did not match anyone in the DNA database. In 2021, investigators partnered with the FBI and made use of more advanced DNA technology. Finally, in 2022, they were able to confirm that Robert Eugene Wartman was indeed responsible for what happened to Helen. They found that he had quite an extensive violent criminal history in the years since he ended Helen's life. In August 1985, Wartman was arrested on suspicion of attempting to assault a woman at the Cocky Bull Restaurant and Bar on Highway 395 in Victorville. In 1991, a jury convicted him of assaulting a different woman at a bar in Apple Valley. In 1995, Wartman passed away while in prison, serving his 22-year sentence. Investigators are sure that he is involved in many other crimes, 
and it is now being investigated. Forty-one-year-old Rose Marie Moniz lived in Bristol County, Massachusetts. On March 23, 2001, Rose's father entered her home to pick her up for a doctor's appointment. He found her body on the bathroom floor and called the police. Investigators found that her purse was emptied out on the floor and an undetermined amount of cash was stolen. The autopsy report described significant trauma to her head including skull fractures. The weapons used to inflict the injuries were a seashell, fireplace poker, and a cast iron kettle. Because of the money stolen from her, police theorized that the motive was burglary. There was, however, no sign of forced entry into the home. This possibly meant that Rose knew her attacker. Investigators found DNA on the seashell, but DNA was not advanced enough yet to test it. In 2019, investigators with the DA's office and state police took another look at Rose's case. They figured that because the seashell's spiky exterior made contact with her, then the culprit most likely put his fingers inside the shell to hold it. Authorities then finally found sufficient DNA for them to create a DNA profile. They were then able to confirm that the DNA belonged to David Reed. He is Rose's half-brother. He also served as a pallbearer at her funeral. Officials say that he beat a woman on June 10, 2003, while she was seated in his truck. He then shoved her out of his vehicle, stole her pocketbook, and left her in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The woman pressed charges and police set out to find Reed. More than a month later, during a police chase, Reed rammed his truck into a law enforcement car, injuring an officer. Cops caught up, but he fled Massachusetts before the trial in 2004. Reed lived on the run for a decade in Florida, Hawaii, and Alabama. In 2015, authorities caught him, but the charges against him had to be dropped because the woman he beat passed away six months earlier, and there was not enough evidence against him. He could still be charged with attempting to flee from officers, ramming his truck into a police cruiser, and bail jumping. He was sentenced to three and a half to four years in prison. It was then that his DNA was taken, and why they could later match it to the DNA found on the seashell. In January of 2022, officers arrested Reed for taking his half-sister's life, and they also brought back their case regarding the woman he beat. Melinda Dernal was born on April 10, 1950, in California. She married Philip LeBeau and took his last name. By 1977, the two of them divorced and Linda had a new boyfriend. She stayed with a new boyfriend in Tustin, California. On October 6th, Linda met up with Philip at a restaurant to collect money he owed her for damaging her boyfriend's car. Philip slashed her boyfriend's tires and poured sugar into the gas tank, resulting in $300 worth of damages. Witnesses reported seeing her arguing with a man believed to be Philip LeBeau at a nearby gas station, and she was never seen again. Linda's boyfriend called police to report her missing when she did not arrive back home. Investigators considered Philip a suspect, but could not prove that he had any involvement in her disappearance. In 1986, a woman's body was found down an embankment along the Ortega Highway in Lake Esenor by highway surveyors. Investigators determined that the victim had been shot in the head, but they could not identify the remains. In August of 2021, investigators exhumed several sets of remains trying to see if one of them matched the woman found in 1986. Linda's remains were identified as a match in January 2022, and it was confirmed that the remains belonged to her. She was just 27 years old when her life was taken. Philip LeBeau passed away in 2008, which makes it even harder to prove that he is responsible, but investigators are still working on the case. 35-year-old Helen Cardwell lived in Chicago in 1992. She had recently moved from New Jersey and was due to start work at Lutheran General Hospital. On November 8, 1992, Helen's sister and brother-in-law came to visit her, but when they entered her room at the Leaning Tower YMCA in Cook County, they discovered her lifeless body. She had been strangled. Investigators collected DNA from the crime scene that belonged to the person that took her life. Detectives worked the case until 1993 but the case went cold due to lack of investigative leads. In late 2020, investigators reopened the case. They submitted numerous pieces of evidence to the Northeastern Illinois Regional Crime Laboratory in Vernon Hills. The DNA of those samples matched the DNA of Richard J. Sisto. Sisto lived close to Helen at the time her life was taken. 
He was on parole for a 1977 assault case in Dallas, Texas. Investigators had trouble finding Sisto after the DNA match in late 2020. Then, in August of 2021, a police database search revealed that Sisto was in jail in Texas on a 2006 parole violation warrant. Cook County detectives then traveled to Texas. There they interviewed Sisto and took a DNA sample. After some more DNA tests, it was confirmed that he was indeed the one that took Helen's life. Sisto was later brought back to Illinois to face the charges against him. It was announced to the public. At the public announcement, Helen's sister, Noka Irvin, spoke. I'm so grateful they decided to reopen this case, and I just appreciate everyone's effort in solving it. 72-year-old Sisto was taken to the Cook County Jail on November 24, 2021. Frustratingly, he passed away in late January 2022. The cause has not been revealed yet. Twenty-one-year-old Pertina Epps lived in Inglewood, California in 2005. On April 26, Pertina's body was found lying in a carport in Gardenia, California. Someone was backing out of one of the four stalls in the carport and then discovered her. A medical examiner determined that she had been strangled. Investigators found fingerprints that did not belong to Pertina on her purse. There was also DNA from a man at the crime scene. They theorized that it belonged to the person that ended her life. Technology was not advanced enough for them to identify the culprit. Investigators could not find other useful leads, so the case went cold. In 2021, investigators took another look at Pertinia's case. They resubmitted forensic evidence from the crime scene using new technology. This led them to 56-year-old Charles Wright. He was arrested on January 27, 2022. Wright denied involvement in the crime. He said his fingerprints were on Pertinia's purse because he sold it to her. According to him, at the time, he was selling purses, tennis shoes, and clothing from the trunk of his car. Wright had a harder time explaining away why his DNA was found at the crime scene. Wright has been working as a teacher since 1999. He said he resigned from Inglewood Unified School District to fight the case against him. This is what he had to say. I didn't do this. The thing is, everybody that knows me knows that I used to sell bags and clothes out of my car. That's the only possible way it could happen. He said he believes people who purchased bags from him during that time period could confirm his story. County Administrator Erica F. Torres, head of Inglewood Unified, told staff and parents in a letter dated Saturday that the district learned of the accusation the day before and that Wright would no longer be teaching at any of its schools. Wright is scheduled for arraignment on June 28, 2022. Authorities said that anyone with information regarding the case can anonymously contact Crime Stoppers at this number. It is not known yet why Wright did what he did, but investigators did say that they don't believe Wright and Pertinia knew each other. On November 6, 1994, human remains were found in the Wright Township near Coopersville in Udawak County, Michigan. The remains were found by hunters. An autopsy revealed that the remains belonged to a woman. It could not be determined how she lost her life, but foul play was suspected. Investigators asked anyone with information to come forward. They also took a look at missing persons cases to see if there was any link. They were not able to find her actual identity, so they referred to her as Matilda. Later, she would be known as Udawal County Jane Doe, 1994. In 2007, the Udawal County Sheriff's Office exhumed the remains and were able to collect DNA. A DNA profile of the victim was then created. She could not be identified, however, because her DNA was not in the combined DNA index system used by the FBI. Recently, the Udawal County Sheriff's Office partnered with the DNA Doe Project to identify the Jane Doe. The DNA Doe Project uses forensic genealogy to identify victims of crime, matching victim DNA to living relatives DNA in various DNA databases. Recently, using that process, they identified the woman as Shelly Ray Keppert. She also went by the name Shelly Ray Christian. She was 29 years old when she went missing in 1993. She lived in Hennepin County, Minnesota, near Minneapolis, but was last known to be in Grand Rapids in February 1994. Udawak County Sheriff's Office Captain Jake Sparks said that Shelly Ray's mother and her children are still alive. Sparks hopes that now the victim's name and photo has been released, investigators can backtrack to see who she was with, 
why she came to Michigan, and hopefully, who she was associating with. Until you know whose death you're investigating, it's very, very difficult to do an investigation, Sparks said. Maybe we have someone who steps forward and says, yes, I knew her, an old roommate or co-worker who can provide some answers, and we can try to drill down into it and figure out who was in her life at that time. None of that can really start until we have her name. Anyone with any information about the investigation or knew Shelly Ray is asked to contact the Udawa County Sheriff's Office or Silent Observer at 1-877-88-SILENT-745-368 or mosotips.com. Shelly Ray was known to wear unique glasses as can be seen in one of the photographs. She may or may not have worn them near the time that her life was taken. Twenty-three-year-old Krista Bramlett lived in New Providence, Tennessee in 1996. She lived in a mobile home and was struggling financially. Krista had two very young children who went to live with her mother in Corpus Christi, Texas. Krista stayed behind, hoping to finish her GED program. The area around her became a bad one, experiencing increasing crime rates, including business burglaries and drug-related offenses. Unfortunately, Krista became a victim of the problems facing New Providence. On the afternoon of October 28, 1996, Krista's landlord knocked on the door of her mobile home in Sunnydale Mobile Home Park just off Peachers Mill Road. Nobody answered. The landlord was concerned, so he looked inside. There, he found Krista's body. She had suffered throat injuries. An autopsy confirmed that she had been suffocated. It was also determined that she was indecently assaulted. Investigators collected male DNA from her body. It was sent to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations lab so that the DNA profile could be created. The DNA profile was submitted into the combined DNA index system, but no matches could be made. Investigators were only able to confirm that the DNA belonged to a black male. Without any other leads in the case, investigators could not identify the culprit and the case went cold. It was only on February 13, 2019, that the Clarksville Police Department detective Michael O'Reilly got the news he was waiting for. The DNA in the combined DNA index system matched a man who was living in Phoenix, Arizona. The man is 48-year-old Kenneth Hudspeth. Hudspeth had never come up in the investigation up to this point, and he was on nobody's radar. In April of 2019, Detective O'Reilly interviewed Hudspeth and discovered that he was indeed in Clarksville at the time Krista's life was taken. He moved away from the area in December of 1997. Hudspeth admitted that he knew Krista and said he was the last person to see her alive. As a result of the DNA evidence and this interview, Hudspeth was arrested and charged in connection with the case. Investigators also took a look at Hudspeth's arrest record. They could see that he had been arrested several times on charges like domestic assault and felony assault. He has spent time in Arizona and Texas prisons. This brings up the question, why wasn't his DNA collected years ago? In June of 2019, Hudspeth appeared in Montgomery County Court for the first time based on the charges against him. In September of 2021, the case finally went to trial. Half of the three-hour interview Detective Olray had with Hudspeth was shown to the jurors. Hudspeth claims that he was doing drugs back then and can't remember if he assaulted her or took her life but hoped that he did not. It was also released that Husband's DNA was found inside of Krista, on her bra, and on two cigarette butts taken from the scene. On September 24, 2021, after four days of testimony, Kenneth Hudspeth was found guilty of all charges against him. Then, in January of 2022, 51-year-old Hudspeth was sentenced to life in prison, plus 20 years for his crimes. Nine-year-old Darylin Johnson lived in Nampa, Idaho in 1982. At 8 a.m. on February 21st, she was walking six blocks from her home to Lincoln Elementary School. She never made it there. Three days later, her body was found by fishermen in a drainage ditch alongside the Snake River. She had been indecently assaulted and drowned. Male hair and DNA was collected from the crime scene. In March 1983, police questioned Charles Fane. His hair was similar to the samples found on the body. He owned a car, similar to one seen at the crime scene, 
and he lived a block away from the Johnson family. Fane denied any involvement in the crime. He also passed a polygraph test, but he was charged with the crimes regardless. At Fane's trial, prosecutors also mentioned that a shoe print found near the body could have been Fane's. Two jailhouse informants testified that they heard Fane admit to committing the crime. Both received reduced sentences in exchange for their testimony. Fane claimed that he was hundreds of miles away at the time of the crime, and his testimony was corroborated by other witnesses. The judge did not permit results of the polygraph test as evidence, and the DNA found inside her body could not rule him out as DNA technology was not advanced enough. On November 4th, 1983, Fane was convicted, and in March of 1984, he was sentenced to death. For nearly two decades, Fane sat behind bars in isolation for up to 23 hours a day. In 1991, he was just four days away from being executed, but it was pushed back. In 1999, when DNA was a little bit more advanced, it was determined that the hairs and DNA found on Darlin's body did not belong to Fane, but an unknown man. He was then exonerated. In August 1999, he was released from the Idaho Maximum Security Institution. In 2019, Investigators decided to take another look at the case. In 2020, using genetic genealogy, they determined that 64-year-old David Dalrymple is responsible. The hair and DNA found at the crime scene belong to him. Investigators found that Dalrymple is currently serving a 20-to-life prison sentence for kidnapping and abusing a child in 2004. After some more investigative work and DNA testing, Dalrymple was formally charged with taking Darylin's life in January of 2022. I am happy to report that Charles Fane is doing well now. He received $1.4 million for the wrongful conviction and recently bought a truck. It doesn't make up for losing nearly two decades of your life, but in the end, justice took place as Dalrymple will most likely be given another life sentence, if not the death penalty.